I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good afternoon. It is great to be here before you one more time and stand and share the word of the Lord with you. As I was thinking and reflecting about what I should leave with you this day, the idea of success came to mind. We are approaching the uh, tail end of the semester and as we approach that, we are wondering whether we will be successful in our endeavors. The students are wondering whether they'll be successful in the writing of their exams. The professors are wondering whether they'll be successful in the grading of the exams. We are all wondering whether we'll be successful in all our intents and purposes as we try to fulfill the academic goals of this institution. Success is something that seems to ingrain our beings all the time. We all want to be successful. We want to be successful in our careers. We want to be successful in our marriages. We want to be successful in our relationships. We want to be successful in our education. We want to be successful in everything we try to do. Success seems to be the tail end, or at least the opposite of what I discussed the last time I talked with you, the question of brokenness. In the midst of a broken society, in the midst of situations where things seem to go wrong, where our politics seem to be broken, where our relationships seem to be broken, where our marriages seem to be broken. How can we succeed? How can we rise above the failures that bedevil us from one minute to another, from one week to another, from one month to another, from one year to another? How can we succeed? Because sometimes the desire for success can be a good one if it comes from the right sources. On other occasions, the desire for success may not necessarily be a good one if it comes from the wrong sources. Sometimes the fear of failure drives our hearts to desire success. And sometimes even the question of pride, the question of ungodly greatness seems to drive our desire for success. But let me point you to a passage of scripture that was read for you earlier on today concerning God-given success. Success as God would want you to have it. Success in the godly way. It is found in the book of 2 Chronicles 26 from verse 3 through 5. It begins as follows. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king in Judah. He reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Ze uh, Jecoliah, and she was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, he, uh, just as his father uh, Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days, during the days of Zechariah, uh, who instructed him in the fear of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. This is a very, very small section and a portion of scripture that you and I can garner some deep insights from with respect to the intention of achieving a certain goal. And the name of that goal, of course, is called success. What exactly is God-given success? Let me put it to you that God-given success comes when we fulfill at least three conditions. God-given success comes, first of all, when we live for God. Secondly, God-given success comes when we learn from God. And, uh, sorry, when we look for God. And third, God-given success comes when we learn from God. Let's begin with the first one. God-given success comes when we live for God. If you read verse 4, the Bible says, He did what was right in the eyes of God. He did what was right in the eyes of God, just as his father Amaziah had done. Uzziah did what was right in the eyes of God, not right in the eyes of the people around him, 
Not right in the eyes of the kings that came before him. Not right in the eyes of the kings of the neighboring countries. But right in the eyes of God. He lived for God. He wanted to make sure that his life in his career as a king reflected the glory of the image of God. He did what was right in the eyes of God. It is something, it is a principle, it is a goal that he learned to live for and if necessary to die for. At least at that stage in his life. That, so that is what he wanted. That is the goal he tried to fulfill. When Nelson Mandela was released from jail after 27 years of incarceration in the early 90s, he walked out of jail and walked right up to uh, a podium where he was asked to address the crowd. And he said this, he said, the things I stood for before I went to jail are as true today as they were true then. I am against white domination. I am against black domination. They are truths for which I am ready to live for and if necessary to die for. C.S. Lewis, after his wife died of cancer, wrote a book entitled A Grief Observed. And in that book, he makes this claim. He says, you never know how much you are willing to believe anything until or unless its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death to you. He said, it is very easy to believe that a rope is strong and sound as long as you use it to tie a box. But if you are to hang on that rope, by that rope, on a cliff, then you begin to test its strength. You begin to test your belief whether it is strong or it is weak. And he says, only a real risk tests the reality of a belief. And that seems to be the risk that King Uzziah was willing to make. He was willing to take that risk and say, I am going to live for God even in a situation where my peers and the people that have gone before me may not be willing to live for God. I am willing to do it. I remember when I was teaching philosophy at the University of Kentucky and then teaching philosophy at Asbury University and much later at Asbury Theological Seminary. I would ask my students this question. What truths are you willing to live for and if necessary to die for? Now, the University of Kentucky is a very secular institution. So the answers that I was given from the University of Kentucky students were as varied as the answers I received from the students at Asbury University and Asbury Theological Seminary. When I asked the students at the University of Kentucky, what truths are you willing to live for and if necessary to die for? They said, I'm willing to live for my freedom and I'm willing to die for my freedom. And when I went to Asbury University, asked them the same question. Most students were unanimous in their consensus, in their statements. They said, yes, I am willing to live for Jesus Christ and if necessary to die for Jesus Christ. And I suspect King Uzziah was willing to live for God and if necessary to die for God. My challenge to you here is, as you are approaching the exam week, live for God in the writing of your exam. Re live for God in the preparation for your exam. As you are preparing yourselves for your career, live for God in the preparation of your career. As you are doing your teaching, as you are moving from one place to another to accomplish your goals, purposes and intentions, live for God. Even as you go to Cancun, Mexico, live for God. Make sure that if you want to be successful, living for God is a part of your lifestyle. Living for God is a part of your trend. Living for God is your tradition. Living for God is a culture that is ingrained in you. So much so that even when being a Christian is a crime, 
there will be enough evidence to get you convicted. God-given success comes when you live for God. Secondly, God-given success comes when you look for God. When you look for God. Look at verse 5. It says, He sought God during the days of Zechariah. He sought God during the days of Zechariah. Why would he seek God? You would think that he had everything he needed. He had the money. He had the prestige. He seemed to have the, uh, the success. He seemed to have even the reputation. After all, he was the king of one of the most powerful nations on earth at that time. But the scripture tells us that he sought the Lord during the days of Zechariah. My suspicion is there was an emptiness in his life that only God could, could fulfill. There was a hunger in his life that only God could fulfill. There was a thirst in his life that only God could fulfill. There was a gap in his life that only God could fulfill. And every time you look at humanity today, there is an emptiness, there is a hunger, there is a thirst, there is a gap that we are striving to fulfill. And only God is big enough to fill that up. You pick up any of the five ultimate questions of life, the questions of origin, the questions of meaning, the questions of morality, the questions of identity, the questions of destiny. Those five categories of life, only God is big enough to fulfill your answers or your search for those questions. If you go to the question of origin, scripture tells us that God created the heavens and the earth. Secularism tells us that we don't miss that. That will be a great day. The question of destiny. Secular humanism will tell you your final destiny is six feet under and that's it. You are, to use the words of the philosopher, theologian and apologist William Lane Craig, you are according to the secular humanist, a cosmological miscarriage. <laughs> but listen, God did not create you as a cosmological miscarriage. You have been created for a purpose. And when King Uzziah sought the Lord, he discovered that only God is, for, is big enough to answer those five questions of life. Origin, meaning, morality, identity, and destiny. Only God is big enough to answer those questions. So my challenge to you is this. Seek the Lord in your life. There are many, many ways of seeking the Lord. This is one of them where you're seated here and praising and worshiping the Lord. When others are trying to look for ways of being successful, if you want to be successful in the God-defined sense, you must seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in a fellowship like this. Seek the Lord in the reading of scripture. Seek the Lord when you are praying. This morning I was doing my early morning job and as I was going down this way, I could hear people praying in this chapel and I said, yes, they are seeking the Lord. Trust me, they are on the correct path to success. God-given success comes when we live for God. God-given success comes when we look for God. God-given success comes when we learn from God. The Bible says, he sought the Lord, in verse 5, he sought the Lord during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. Who instructed him in the fear of God. He learned from God. His lessons came from God. He got his marching orders from God. He moved only when God told him to move and stopped when God told him to stop. He learned from God. Zechariah was there to instruct him, to teach him and tell him, this is the way, walk ye in it. God taught him how to live his life, how to conduct his life, how to behave in front of people, how to deliver his speeches, how to deliver his addresses. God taught him how to govern the nation. God taught him how to stand before God and fear him. He learned from God. He lived for God. He looked for God. And he learned from God. The lessons of life were dispensed to him. 
through the experience of being a king, he learned about what Solomon did, and he was putting all that into practice. He learned about what David did, he was putting it into practice. He learned about the other kings, he even learned from the mistakes of others. He learned from God. Whether it was through theoretical lectures or experiential encounters, he learned from God. I had just completed a series of sermons in Maryland, uh, in, in, in Baltimore, Maryland. And my wife and I were there, I had been asked to speak, and I completed a series of sermons. And I was flying back to Lexington, Kentucky. And as, uh, as we were flying back, we had to make a connecting flight to Detroit, Michigan. And while we were waiting there, we finally called, were called in to board the plane. And we got into the plane and were seated in there. It was about a 50-seater plane. And we were sitting there waiting to take off. Then the pilot announces from his cockpit and says, There is a storm passing by. There is a storm passing by. We cannot fly into that storm. It will be dangerous. So we have to wait for 10 minutes until the storm is gone. In less than five minutes, we got to hear again from the cockpit. The Bible said, we have been cleared for takeoff. And we said, oh, okay. We thought it was 10 minutes. Now it's five, so we've been cleared. It must be five. When we were taking off, the pilot flew right into the storm. The plane was tossed back and forth. Our heads, never mind that we had our seatbelts on. Our heads were banging up there, hitting one another, and there were about 50 people in that plane. All of them were calling on the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. I've never heard of the name of Jesus called so many times before. And they were all crying and throwing wailing and screaming and we were wondering, shall we live through this? Shall we see the crowd again? Shall we ever see? Shall I ever see my people in Kenya again? Shall I ever see my wife again who was sitting next to me? And I was really pressing her hand. And the thing went on and on we thought the plane would break in two. Finally it was over. And the pilot says, sorry for that little thing back there. <laughs> When the pilot tells you something like that, it's time to begin expressing your religious beliefs. <laughs> and that's when everybody was calling on the name of Jesus. I discovered one thing. When you experience life-threatening moments, that's the, when you experience life-threatening moments, that's when God comes squarely and sharply into focus. You begin to learn that there is something in this world that we do not even know about that only God can tell us about. When C.S. Lewis lost his wife, a certain movie company, a movie company decided to depict the passion and the pathos of that experience in a movie. And Anthony Hopkins was asked to act as C.S. Lewis. And when uh, the wife had been depicted as dead and all that, the wife had died, Anthony Hopkins basically wept so uncontrollably, picking up or at least trying to depict the passion and the pain that Lewis went through. And then one of the lines in that movie caught my attention, and it was this. C.S. Lewis was depicted as saying, they tell me experience is a brutal teacher, but my God, you learn. It is a painful experience sometimes to go through some of those life lessons. But when you learn from God, the important thing is you will be successful. You see, God is indispensable for your success. You cannot take him out of the picture. You cannot take Jesus Christ out of the picture. If success is your goal, if you seem to have made a lot of money and Christ is not in the picture, you are an ultimate failure. But success comes when you live for God, when you look for God, when you learn from God. Those are three key ingredients in success. And so I challenge you, learn from God. Read your Bible. Don't leave it behind. Be in fellowship with other Christians. Don't throw that away. Listen to the counsel of your elders. 
The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Some translations have it as the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. Wisdom is the application of those facts. And that's why you can find some professors very, very highly educated. They know all, that they have all the knowledge in the, in, in the world, but, they get, uh, but then again, they're not wise. With all their knowledge, they go to the pub and they treat themselves stupid. The following day, you find them completely passed out in a gutter with all that sewage running all over them. And you ask, where is the wisdom in this? When you learn from God, not only will you have accumulated facts, but you will learn how to apply that in your life. God is indispensable for your success. You cannot kick him out of the picture. You cannot throw him out of the picture. Think about it. In philosophy, Plato was replaced by Aristotle. In theology, Augustine was replaced by Aquinas. In literature, Shakespeare was replaced by Charles Dickens. In science, Newton was replaced by Einstein. In politics, Honorable Mikey Baki was replaced by Uhuru Kenyatta. But in life, Jesus Christ is irreplaceable. His rule is unbreakable. His will is indefeasible. What he condemns, no one can redeem. What he redeems, no one can condemn. The doors he shuts, no one can open. The doors he opens, no one can shut. Because he is immortal, he is invisible, he is eternal, he is almighty. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. The singers have called him the Lion of Judah, the Great Physician, the Lily of the Valley. When you remember that this is Jesus, the one who is indispensable to your success, I dare you to trust in him. Live for God. Look for God. Learn from God. God bless you.